Tonight we want to talk about the symbolism of snakes, dragons, serpents. We find such serpentine creatures all over the place in the Torah, outside of Torah, in Jewish literature, in non-Jewish literature, all over the world. There's this repeating motif of snakes and dragons and serpentine figures. So we want to explore the symbolism of that, and we will see what it has to do with the times that we are in, because it's actually very significant. So where do we see a snake or a serpent for the first time in the Torah? Because it's right at the beginning. Where is it? (laughs) Even before. Even before that. In the Torah Torah itself, where is the first place in the Torah that we see serpents mentioned? Even before. Even before. Yeah, in Bereshit, right in chapter 1, right in the beginning of creation, we see... No, before that. What? Chapter 1. So, on the fifth day, what did God create on the fifth day? Good. So, on the fifth day, it says, So, let the waters teem with life. And and there will be birds. So, God made fish and birds. And then, it says something really mysterious. These large serpents. It's translated often as sea monsters. Uh, it could be translated as large lizards, even. Tanin could mean sometimes a crocodile, right, or some kind of lizard. Reptile. So large God made the great reptiles. So some people see in that an allusion to dinosaurs, actually, because literally dinosaur in Latin means, you know, a terrible lizard, a great terrible lizard. So if you translate Taninimak Dolim into Latin, it's actually dinosaur. So some people see in this an allusion to dinosaurs. Uh, we're not going to talk about dinosaurs today. We've talked about it before, about dealing with dinosaurs and the fossil record and evolution. So you can refer to that video from a few years ago. But there is here, uh, for some people, some see this as a reference to dinosaurs. But anyway, Tanini Magdolim, a tanin really is a serpent, because later when we see when Moses came before Pharaoh and dropped his staff, Right? We know it tr- turned into a snake. But the word that's used there is actually not nachash, which is the more common word for a snake, but it actually says tanin. Right? So a tanin is, generically, broadly speaking, a serpent. So right at the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, we see that God created these great serpents, these terrible serpents. Now, who, what were these terrible serpents? The Midrash says, anybody know what the Midrash says about these, who these were? So the Midrash identifies these serpents as the Leviathan, Leviathan, Leviathan. And it says that God made two of them, like God originally made two of every animal. So God made two of these great Leviathans, but they were so terrible that he destroyed them. So again, that connects, some people see that as a reference to dinosaurs, that these great terrible creatures that existed, but they were so terrible that God destroyed them. So the Midrash already, millennia ago, said that the Taninim Gdolim were destroyed. And more specifically, we say that, and Rashi quotes this, that there were two of them, and the Gemara says this, and God slayed the female, and he castrated the male. So the male still presumably exists somewhere. Again, you can decide whether you want to take this literally or metaphorically, but presumably this great male dragon who was castrated so that he can't reproduce, exists somewhere, and the female was slayed. And Rashi says, Hataninim, he comments on this. He first says, okay, Dagim Gdolim Shabayam, just means like the great fish in the seas. But then he brings the Midrash, Hu Liviatan, Uben Zugo. So this is the Leviathan, the two Leviathans, Shebaram Zachar ben Nekeva, that God made like all other creatures, male and female. Ve'aragat and Nekeva, and he killed the female, and preserve the, the flesh of the female for, I guess, smoked salmon or whatever, locks for for the feast of the righteous in the world to come. Okay, because I guess Jews can't go without the locks and the cream cheese, even in the Messianic age. So God killed the, the female Leviathan, preserved, salted the meat of the female Leviathan. 
why shem ifru ve'irbu lo yitkayem ha'olam bifnei Because if they were to multiply, then they would, they would, you know, the world could not endure with such terrible monsters. Okay, so the male monster is somewhere, Leviathan, is, is left somewhere in the seas. So do we have proof, scriptural proof? Some people will say, oh, that's like a crazy midrash. There's no way that we, I can believe that, that there's some dragon roaming the seas. But there is a verse, multiple verses, in scripture itself, in the Tanakh, that support this. Uh, so Psalm 104, in Tehillim we say this. Uh, actually, there's the previous verse to this, there's a previous verse which we explored last time, which is Asayarech lemoadim shemesh yadam evo. So last time when we talked about the solar eclipse that's coming up, we quoted this pasuk, shemesh yadam evo, that the sun knows when it's coming, when what's coming. So some people say the sun knows when the geula, when the redemption is coming, so look to the sun. And so we talked about that before when we talk about the eclipse as a sign of the redemption. But then just a few verses after that, it says, uh, a verse we say in our prayers all the time, Hashem, like how great are God's works, Kulam asita, God made all things, all his creations with great wisdom. And it goes on to say, Zehayam gadol yadayim, uh, sham remes ve'ein mispar chayot, that the sea is full of countless creatures, ktanotim gdolot, great and small, small and big, and sham oniyot yalechun, that the ships go by the sea, and then, this is important, it ends, the verse ends by saying, Leviathan, the Leviathan, ze yatsarta lesachekbo. You created the Leviathan to play with him. That's the like pshat translation, which seems really bizarre. What does that mean? God made the Leviathan, this great sea dragon, to play with, to sport with, to toy with. So that's a clear scriptural verse that supports the existence of a Leviathan, of some, this dragon in the seas. And who is this Leviathan? So the Gemara actually devotes a couple of pages to discussing this in Bava Batra. I'm, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but just as a quick description of, to visualize the Leviathan, the Gemara says, Besha'a Leviathan ra'ev, when the Leviathan is hungry, motzi hevel mipiv, he breathes from his mouth, and that's, keep that in mind, that's really important. Hevel mipiv, we're going to come back to that term. Umartiach kol and he makes all the deep waters of the deep boil. So this is very much like a mythical fire-breathing dragon. How do we know? Shene'emar, there's a verse to prove it in Job, in Eov, yartiach kesir metzula, that Job is talking about this Leviathan, that it makes the deep waters boil. And if the Leviathan would not have stuck its head in the Garden of Eden, it would be so stinky that it would be impossible to withstand. It's such a putrid fish. Again, we have to think of this on a deeper level. What, why does the Gemara even bother to tell us this? That the Leviathan is so putrid that you wouldn't be able to withstand its smell had it not stuck its head in the Garden of Eden. You know, at some point in the garden, it was probably swimming and stuck its head out of the water. And the, the fragrance of the Garden of Eden covered up the bad smell. of the, So we also talked about in the Purim class, if you heard the Purim class, we talked about the power of smell. And what does that mean? The whole smell of the Garden of Eden, the, the whole symbolism of smell and the power of the nose. So you can refer to that class and connect the dots. What is it about the, this Leviathan, this fire-breathing dragon that also smells really terribly? Were it not for the Garden of Eden, we wouldn't be able to withstand its smell. Now, it goes on and says like this, Amar Amar Yochanan, So like we just said, that in the future world, in the Messianic age, at the Feast of the Righteous, God will feed the righteous, the flesh of Leviathan. And there's a verse to prove it. And the verse is from Job again, Yichru alav chabarim. So he's saying, what does this verse in Job mean? And it goes through a very clear and derivation that it means this verse in Job is a source for the feast of the righteous in the world to come. And chabarim or chaverim means the righteous, to say the people who learn Torah. Torah scholars are called chaverim and then righteous people are called chaverim, which also means friends and companions. So all the friends in the world to come in the feast, at the Feast of the Righteous, will eat the flesh of Leviathan. Okay, and it proves it from a couple of verses in Kings and Job. 
And then it says, God will make a sukkah for the righteous, from the skin of the Leviathan, from the scales, the scaly skin of the Leviathan, God will make a sukkah. And again, there's a verse for it in Job to prove it, that you will uh, you know, fill the sukkah with his skin. So there's a clear verse for it again, a scriptural verse to support this idea. So there's this Leviathan, the Leviathan, the, the original Leviathan, God slayed and then preserved its meat. And then there's a tradition that Mashiach will slay the remaining Leviathan. And then the skins of the Leviathan will be used to make the Sukkah. And we talked about this before, that Sukkot is associated with the redemption and this is clear in Tanakh that in the end of days and in the Messianic age, all the nations of the world actually will visit Jerusalem once a year on Sukkot and celebrate together with Israel. And so there will be a Sukkah of, Levi- of Leviathan. And what will happen with the leftovers? So this Leviathan is this massive dragon and you don't need so much of the skin. What's going to happen with the leftovers of the skin? V'ashar porso kadosh baruchu al chomot Yerushalayim. And God will drape the walls of Jerusalem with the rest of the Leviathan's skin. So maybe instead of the kotel, you're going to have this uh, colorful psychedelic fish scales that, you know, reflect light. And it's going to be so splendorous and shiny and sparkly that it's going to shine across the world. And mm-hmm, exactly. On Sukkot, that's exactly it. So on Sukkot, when we add the Arachaman, there's an insert to talk about, may we merit to sit in the Sukkah of Libyatan. This is exactly where it comes from. And there's a verse in, again, Isaiah brings a verse to prove it, that in the end of days, all the nations will walk in this great light. So this is the light of the, reflected by the skin of Leviathan. Again, these are Midrashim. You don't have to take them literally. There is a metaphorical meaning there. So what does this all mean? We want to understand the symbolism of these creatures. Okay, so that was the dragon. That was Leviathan. That was the first one, which seems to have a more negative connotation as this terrible beast that is going to be slain. That what one was already slain and then the other will be slain again in the end of days. So that's the Leviathan. Okay, then what? After that, that's chapter one, Taninim Gdolim. Then where is the next serpentine creature in the Torah? Moshe. The Nachash. Then we have chapter 3. Chapter 3 begins by saying, And there was this Nachash, the serpent, who was the cunning, the most cunning and wisest creature of all the creatures God made. And he came to the woman, to Eve. Right? Did God really say he started to mess with her mind. Did God really say that you're not allowed to eat from the tree? Keep in mind that when the Nachash first approached Eve, he wasn't actually a Nachash yet, right? He was a, an angel with arms and legs. And the punishment after was that God ripped off the appendages and condemned him to be a snake on the ground. So we call the snake animal a Nachash like because of what happened to this figure, Nachash, and not the other way. You see what I'm saying? So the figure was not called, the figure was not called Nachash because it was a snake, but the other way. We call the animals Nachashim, like snakes, Nachash, after that being that had lost its appendages and was condemned to slither on the ground. So we're going to have to see that. Is, this, is there a connection to the Tanin? So the Nachash was the most arum, right? And, and seemingly the only one that could speak also, that he was able to actually speak to Eve. So God gave the Nachash, he, this human-like, he was clearly an angel with, with great power, with divine wisdom. And the punishment was that he was turned into a serpent. And God, and the Nachash tells Adam and Eve that if you eat from the tree, you will be like God. So Vayomer Nachash al-Aisha, uh, don't worry, if you eat from the tree, you're not going to die. Ki yodea Elohim, ki beyom acholchem mimeno, venifkechu, einechem, veeitem ke Elohim yodei tov If you eat from the tree, don't worry, you're not going to die, but you're going to be like God, and you will know greater wisdom. You will know good and evil, and you will be like gods. So the Nachash is promising Adam and Eve this secret divine wisdom, and the Nachash has this 
So on the one hand, he seems we, we associate the Nachash as this like evil figure, but on the other hand, it seems like the, nachash, the intentions of the Nachash are, are quite positive. It's to liberate man and to give man the opportunity to attain higher divine wisdom, almost like prophetic ability. And so the Nachash becomes associated with actually with prophecy and with channeling divine information. How do you say to divine in Hebrew? In the Torah itself, when it says Yosef would divine and predict the future and get information about the future, Yosef at Sadiq in Egypt, what is the verb that's used? L'nachesh, right? L'nachesh, that he would be like a serpent. So Yosef, Yosef at Sadiq would be menachesh, that he would be like a snake, like di- drawing down divine wisdom. So there's an association between the Nachash and prophetic ability and becoming godlike, having godlike wisdom. So even Yosef is described as being menachesh. Right? In Hebrew, menachesh means to divine information. And we find the same, actually, in cultures all over the world. So in modern Hebrew, it's more of like a guess, like an, to, to guess. But the, the Torah definition is more than just guessing. It's to divine, to divine information. And we see this all over the world. You know, in, in ancient Greece... So in the city of Delphi, there was an oracle, the Oracle of Delphi, which is where the ancient Greeks used to go to communicate, you know, to get divine information. And the legend, the Greek legend of the oracle was that there was a python, this, this again, a, a snake. And python also actually is a Torah word. We read it in Tehilim, al-feten, right? Befeten tidroch. So feten is python, same exact word. So there was this python, and Apollo slew the python, slayed, slew, slayed the python, and the, over top of the python's carcass, they built the oracle, this temple, and the fumes of the python would go up to this prophetess, and she would smell the fumes, again, the smell connection, the fumes of the re- decaying python, and she would prophesy. And so the name of the, the, the prophet in the oracle, this woman, the prophetess, she was called Pythia. So the Pythia was a prophet, and she prophesied through the snake. So again, the same idea of Lenachesh. So again, we see a connection to the snake and prophecy and higher wisdom. Same thing for the Romans. What is the holy hill for the Romans? You know, Rome was built on the hills, on seven hills. And then there was another hill, right? If you've ever been right across the river. And what's the holy hill in Rome? Still holy for Christians today, or at least for Catholics. It's Vatican. Right. The Vatican, what was the Vatican? Before it was associated with Catholicism, the Vatican was a pagan hill. That's where the ancient Romans did their pagan rituals. The word Vatican, actually, vatus means prophecy, prophet in Latin. So Vatican, Vaticania is prophecies. And it actually, according to many scholars, it means, it's exactly the word lenachesh. It means a divining serpent, a prophesying serpent. So the Vatican hill actually means the hill of the prof- prophetic serpent, the snake, prophesying through the snake. So the Vatican also is tied to Le Nachesh of receiving prophecy through snake energy. And it's not just in the old world. In, Mid- in Mesoamerica, same, the Aztecs and the Mayans, who is their main figure, their main deity, the one that brought them divine wisdom. Anybody know? Been to Riviera Maya, Kukulkan, right? And, the, and with Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. In Aztec and Mayan beliefs, there's the same idea of a feathered serpent who came down from heaven and taught them all this like divine information. So you see it all over the world. You see it in the Far East, in China, the symbolism of the snake, the wise and cunning snake, which we're going to talk about because I want to get to the Chinese zodiac in particular. And in Hinduism, Hinduism as well, the snakes play a huge, huge role. There are snake deities, the Nagas. Kundalini Yoga. Good. And Kundalini. What is Kundalini? Who's heard of Kundalini? That's where I was heading, right? Kundalini is this, in Hinduism, this snake that's believed to be coiled up at the root of your spine. And there's this divine energy there. And it's uh, supposed to you know, elevate you and give you the spiritual enlightenment and awakening as the snake coils up your spine from the base of your spine up to your brain. And there's all this kundalini idea, kundalini yoga and so on, of attaining enlightenment through kundalini. And actually, believe it or not, our sages say pretty much the same thing. Because what do our sages say about your spine? 
and about the Amidah and about prayer. Think about it. We have 18. We say, our prayer, the main prayer is the Amidah, right? The main Jewish prayer that we pray three times a day. If you pray this, you fulfill the mitzvah of prayer, right? All the other things we do, the Teilim, the Psukei Zimra, that's just preparation. But to fulfill the mitzvah of prayer, you really just need to say the Amidah. And the Amidah is the Jewish prayer. And how many blessings are in the Amidah? 18. So now there's 19, but originally 18, it's called the Shmona Esra. And why 18? And our sages say that there are 18 blessings corresponding to the 18 vertebrae of the spine. And we bow when we pray in a snake-like motion. That's how our sages describe it. So just to take a step back a bit, when a baby is born, your spine is surrounded by the vertebrae, the bones that protect the spine. The vertebrae, when you're born, has 33 parts to it. There are 33 bones at birth. Okay, 33 is a very significant number. 33 is a number that represents enlightenment, of achieving elevation, spiritual refinement, of, of plunging into the secrets of Torah. There's a verse, King David says, asks God, Gal enai ve'abita niflaot mitorotecha. Open my eyes, gal enai. Gal means to open, to reveal. Like megillah, legalot, to reveal. So King David says in Tehilim, gal enai, open up my eyes, Hashem. So that I can see all the secrets and mysteries and wonders of your Torah. Gal, Gimel Lamed, is 33. Lag Baomer is the 33rd day of the Omer, the, the most mystical day of the year, the holiday that celebrates Kabbalah and Zohar and mysticism when Rashbi Shimon Bar Yochai revealed the mystical dimension of Judaism almost 2,000 years ago. That was Lag Baomer, and it's specifically Lag. It's the 33rd day of the Omer. Because that's the day of revelation. And you'll find that the day of, of tapping into the Torah's deeper secrets. So you'll find this number 33 all over the place. So at birth, a baby has 33 bones along its spine, representing this process of elevating up 33 steps. But then as you mature into an adult, those bones fuse together. So as an adult, how many bones do you have along in your vertebrae? 26. So you have 26 bones which is Hashem. It's yud Hey vav Hey, right? It's the value of the tetragrammaton of Hashem's name is 26. So you start off with 33. You're, you're ascending the, those 33 steps to reach to Hashem, to reach to the infinite, to God. Ayahove Ihiyeh, right? That's God, the infinite one, who is 26. Now, so you have 26 vertebrae, 30, 26 bones along your spine with the sacrament coccyx all the way down to your tailbone. And then... When you actually bow, the Gemara says when you bow, 18 of those vertebrae protrude. So you can try this at home after if you don't have back problems. So you bow, you bow and you can try to feel, you will feel, maybe not depending on you know, your musculature. You should be able to feel 18 bones as you bow. So the Gemara says that when you bow, when you pray, you feel 18 bones. So... It says in Masechet Brachot, Hanei Shmona Yisrael keneged mi, Amar Rabbi Hillel, keneged Shmona Yisrael askarot sh'amar David behavu l'Hashem b'nei Elim. So corresponding, the 18 blessings of the Amidah correspond to the 18 times that King David mentioned God in that psalm, Psalm 29. Rav Yosef Amar keneged Shmona Yisrael askarot sh'bekriyat Shma. It corresponds to the 18 times God is mentioned in the Shma. Amar Rabbi Tanchum, Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, keneged Shmona Yisrael chuliot sh'bashidra. So this is the one. So another opinion is, it's, they're all true. The uh, 18 blessings of the Amidah also correspond to the 18 bones of the vertebrae that protrude when you bow. And then on another page in Barchot, it says, Rav Sheshet ki kara, kara ki chizra. When he would bow, he would bow straight like a cane. Kiz, uh, and ki kazakif, and when he would go up from his bow, zakif ki chivia. He would come up like a snake. So this whole idea of, of bowing is connected to the snake, the Gemara says. You're supposed to bow in some kind of snake. Your spine, your vertebrae are supposed to resemble a snake. And there are 18 actual vertebrae that protrude. The Gemara says in Bava Kama, uh, Shidro Shel Adam, so your spine, when a person dies, 
their spine. What happens to a person's spine in the grave after they die? The body decomposes. But seven years after your body decomposes, what's left of the spine? No, not that. It says, Crazy, right? What? What is the Gemara saying? The body decomposes, but what's left? The, sna- the spine is a snake. Bizarre. But then the Gemara clarifies that. But only if you didn't bow when you said modim during the Amidah. Right? So a person who doesn't bow during modim, their spine will turn into a snake. Very interesting. Their spinal cord, their vertebrae will turn into a snake. Very interesting. Obviously, not literal, because we don't see snakes slithering out of cemeteries every, you know, all over the place. So uh, it's not meant to be taken literally, but the, the symbolism, again, of the spine corresponding to the snake, same, very similar to in other cultures and religions, the idea of the, especially in Hinduism and Kundalini and all of that, the idea of the snake and the spine, that connection. And all with regards to prayer, Masechet Brachot, uh, in uh, the Mishnah, the first Mishnah in chapter 5, it says when you're supposed to pray, how are you supposed to pray? You shouldn't come to pray, you shouldn't stand to pray the, pray the Amidah until you are very serious and you have Kavana, Kovid Rosh, your head is very heavy, you're in the right state of mind. And Chasidim Harishonim, the ancient pious sages, our ancient pious sages, the pious ones, what would they do before praying the Amidah? They would meditate for an hour. Our sages used to meditate for an hour to get to the point where they can say the Amidah. And that's really what's happened now over the years that we've added so many extras before the Amidah, various blessings and psalms and whatever. That's, it, bas- it almost takes an hour to get to the Amidah, and that's all part of this. It's to get us into the right state of mind to get to the Amidah. It's to parallel that, to meditate for an hour before you get to the climax of the prayers, which is the Amidah. And this is the interesting part, that they were so, they had such intense kavana, and they were so deep in their meditation. Even if a king would come and say, hey, how's it going? He wouldn't respond. He was so out of this world that he wouldn't even respond to a king. And this is how it ends. V'afilu nachash karucha lakavo, akevo. And even if a snake would curl up on his heel around his ankle, lo yafsik. So again, the symbolism, the imagery of a snake, that they were praying, they would meditate for an hour, they would get to such a high state, out of such a high out-of-body experience, that they were completely oblivious to what's going on around them, that even if a snake curled up along their ankle, they wouldn't budge. So you see over and over again, the symbolism of snake connected to our prayers and to meditation and to out-of-body experiences and enlightenment and to the spinal cord and to the vertebrae. Now, what's interesting is, to tie it into kundalini, kundalini is considered a feminine energy. It's a feminine power. And in Judaism as well, the snake, this snake, has feminine power. And it's associated with Eve. The snake approached Eve and our sages even say, how do you say in the Talmud and in the Zohar, I already said the word, how do you say snake in Aramaic? The Talmudic snake. Chiviya. I said this, the word earlier. The sages, the, the, the Aramaic word for a snake is Chiviya. And our sages say, why is a snake called Chiviya? Same root as Chava. That there's a connection. Originally, they say that Chava, her original name was Chaya. That she was called Chaya, the mother of, M Kol Chai, the mother of all life. And after the association with the snake, she became Chava, right? Because of the Chivia, because of the snake that came to her. So again, the connection between, there's this feminine energy, the snake as having feminine energy. And this is where it all comes together because the Shmona Yisrael, the Amidah, doesn't have 18, doesn't have 18 uh, blessings. It has 19 blessings because they added a 19th bless, blessing, Birkat Aminim, which is against the heretics. So the sages instituted a 19th blessing. So then, what's the 19th bone? You only have 18 protruding bones when you bow. So what's the 19th? The 19th is the very tip of your vertebrae, the the coccyx, the tailbone, that you can also feel all the way down, all the way at the very bottom, the very root of all this feminine energy, this kundalini energy, this chiviya energy. So you have 19 blessings, 19 protrusions, corresponding to this feminine energy, which is the Chivya, which is Chava. 
And what's the gematria of Chava? Chet, Vav, oh, Hey, 19. 19. So Chava herself is 19, corresponding to your serpentine vertebrae, the 19 points. It all comes together. All right. So that's that. So then you have this feminine female energy, Nachash. You know, and it's interesting in our, we say that the Nachash is this power of Lenachesh, of, of divining, of, of prophecy. And it's interesting that oftentimes our sages say that the women in the Torah were greater prophets than the men. That Sarah was a greater prophet than Avraham. God told Avraham, listen to Sarah, right? Like whatever Sarah tells you, you listen to her. Right? So Sarah was greater than, in terms of prophecy than Avraham. Rivka was greater than Yitzchak. Right? They had trouble, and it didn't, doesn't say Yitzchak wanted to go, when she had uh, this battle in her womb, it doesn't say Yitzchak got prophecy, it says Rivka uh, went to inquire of Hashem. So Rivka, although people say she went to Shem, but that's just male chauvinism, because they can't accept that Rivka got her own prophecy. So no, she went to a man to tell her. She needed mansplaining for her to tell her what it was. So, no, that's what they say. The, the pshat is that she got the prophecy, but then there's a rabbinic opinion. No, no, no way that a woman got the prophecy. She went to Shem. And, yeah, Litrosh Hashem. She went to ask God. <laughs> she went straight to the source. Anyway, so Rivka was greater than Yitzhak. Uh, Leah was greater than Yaakov. We talked about that before. Leah, Gimachi is 36 because she went all the way up to the Oraganuz. Esther is greater than Mordechai. Chana is greater than Eli. Eli had no clue what she was up to, and she was divining, and he was like, what's going on? And Avigail is described as greater than David. She's one of the greatest prophetesses. The wife of the king, uh, Shimshon's mother, who we're going to get to, Tzlel Ponit, was greater than uh, Manoach, her husband. So there's a theme of the woman being greater than the man in this. But also, but also... Don't get carried away, ladies. At the same time, the Mishnah also says, ben nashim Yes, I'm going to bring you back down to earth because the Mishnah also says, ben nashim shafim, that women are also... Yeah, there's also an association of women with, witch, exactly, with witchcraft. Shafim is witchcraft because historically women were also more associated with witchcraft, but for the same reasons because you know how it is, right? With potential... When it comes to potential energy, you can use it for goodness and for evil. You, so they, a, a woman has more power to use holy energy and holy prophecy, but also there's a temptation towards the sitra achra, towards the impure forces of which You only want the good, huh? You only want to hear the good things. <laughs> I had to bring you back down to earth a little bit. So the point is that you have to channel that energy. You have to channel that energy in the right direction. And so on the one hand, women are associated with higher prophetic power, but also with higher wizardry and witchcraft. So we see this, this imagery of the snake as somehow a, a, a being of wisdom that's able to access higher prophetic divine information. So is the snake a negative symbol or a positive one? Right? Is this, we, we associate the Nachash in the Garden of Eden as a very negative symbol, but actually... There's a lot of positives to this. It's the Leviathan that's more negative, that's described as being more terrible. But the Nachash is actually has a lot more positive aspects to it. And we sometimes forget to ask the question, who made the Nachash? Who sent the Nachash to Eve? God did, right? God made the Nachash. God gave the Nachash speech. Why did he do that? God made the Nachash the most arum, the most cunning and the wisest. Why did he do that? Everything comes back to God. And the Zohar actually says, the Zohar says based on a verse in, in Kohelet, in Ecclesiastes, im yeshucha nachash belo, nacha, belo lachash, so based on that, those words, can a snake bite without a lachash? It's like a play on words. And the Zohar says, lo nashich that a, a snake will never bite a person, ad delechashin le mila'ela, until God whispers to it to do so from heaven. So, God, and the Zohar is really alluding to the Garden of Eden, that no snake does anything without God. God is in charge of all creatures. And the Midrash says this actually explicitly. In Midrash Tanchuma, it says, So commenting on Yosef being thrown into a pit with snakes and being taken then to Egypt, 
What does the Midrash say? Lechu chazu, it's, it's quoting a verse in Psalms. Lechu chazu mi fa'alot Elohim, nora alila al bnei adam. That God is doing acts circuitously. Nora alila, he makes all kinds of tricks. He has to work in mysterious ways, as the old saying goes. God kind of plays with us. Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Korchach, how do we know? Afa noraot she'ata mevi alenu ba'alila at mevian. You bring about, you act circuitously with us. When God created the world, He created the angel of death on the first day. How do we know the angel of death was created on the first day? Because it says that God made darkness upon the deep. And what is darkness? So the, the force of darkness is who darkens Mankind who darkens all of creation, who puts people to sleep permanently. The Malach HaMavit is the, dar- the force of darkness. So when did darkness come into being? God created darkness on the first day. So God created darkness on day one. And then God created man on the sixth day. And what did he do? He said he brought darkness upon the man and told him, you're going to die if you eat from the tree. So God already on day one brought death and darkness into the world, then told Adam, hey, don't eat from the tree because then it's going to bring death and darkness into the world. But who made death and darkness? God did. So God actually arranged this whole thing. As the Zohar says, no snake bites without God telling it to. So God sent the snake. And if God didn't do that, none of us would be here right now. So the snake was actually necessary to move, to set history in motion. The Zohar and the Arizal use this analogy of the necessity of the snake. So God created the snake. It seems in a, for a negative reason, but God did it on purpose. And God reminds us in Ishayahu, very famous verse, Ania, what is it? We say it in our prayers, but our sages reworked it to soften it up. Right before we say Shema, what do we say? Yotzer O, Ubore Choshech, and then? And? Ose Shalom, Ubore. Et akol. That's what we say in our prayers, but that's not the pasuk in Isaiah. <laughs> it's yotzer or exactly. Ubore choshek ose shalom ubore ra. Right? Ani Hashem ose kol ele. I create evil. Don't think that there's some other force out there that I am the one that does everything. Ani Hashem ose kol ele. I form the good and the bad, light and dark. Right? So I'm in charge of the whole cosmos, and don't think that there's anything other here. Einod milvado. It's all God. So the the Zohar uses an analogy of a deer that is trying to give birth but can't and it needs help and then the snake comes and bites the deer the heel or whatever bites the deer and then the deer from the the fear and the panic pushes the baby out that's the analogy of the necessity of the snake so the snake is necessary so we see it as this evil force but actually it all comes from god and it's all necessary the snake has this great oral power. It's able to speak. It's able to bite. It's, it's associated with prayer and with meditation. All of these oral powers, it's all about the power of the mouth. Right? It all connects back to the mouth. And the snake has that unique tongue that it's always putting out and sensing the world around it. So the mouth, the power of the mouth is tied directly to the snake. And the Arizal explains in Shara Psukim, Ki anachash en koho ela befiv that the power of the snake is in its mouth. And he says this when talking about Bilam. Because remember Bilam, Bilam was the greatest prophet among the non-Jews. He was the counterpart to Moses. Our sages say that God made Moshe as the greatest prophet for Israel. And so that the nations of the world wouldn't protest, the nations of the world would say, hey, it's not fair. Why did Israel get Moses? What about us? So God says, fine, I'll give you Bilam. That Bilam was almost like equal to Moses in prophetic ability. He was the Moses of the Gentiles, Bilam. And the Arizal explains that Bilam, who Nachash, that he used the power of the Nachash. And a Nachash, kocho ela befiv, vechen Bilam, sheikro min hevel. So this is a very interesting. Vehu hevel hara yotze min hapeh. So the Arizal explains there's a very deep reincarnation here. Cain killed Abel. Cain and hevel. Cain killed Abel. The Arizal, very famous Arizal, that Hevel reincarnated in who? So the He reincarnated in Moshe and the Bet Lamed of his name. Hevel is He Bet Lamed. 
so the He went to Moshe, and the Bet Lamed went to Bilam. Actually, first it went to Lavan, and then Lavan ruined it, so then it went to Bilam. And then actually it went again to Naval. So you see the Bet Lamed all over the place. So you can actually trace reincarnations through names. So the He of Hevel went to Moshe. The Beit Lamed of Hevel went to Bilam. And the Arizal is saying, that's the power. Hevel, what does Hevel mean? Hevel means the breath of, your, of the mouth. Like we said with Leviathan. What did it say the first thing we quoted? Leviathan, Hevel Mipiv. From the breath of his mouth, he's able to boil the waters. So Hevel means breath. And the He went to Moses, and the Beit Lamed went to Bilam. And each of them represents the two powers of the Nachash. Because Moshe represents a Nachash. Remember, his staff turned into a snake. And then later in the wilderness, when the people were dying, what did he do? He had to make a Nechushtan, a Nachash Nechoshet. He made a snake, a staff with copper, a copper snake staff to heal the people. So Moses is associated with the snake himself. He had a snake, that, a staff that turned into a snake, and then he even built a copper snake. And Bilam is associated with the negative powers of the snake. So there's the positive powers of the snake, which is embodied by Moshe, and the negative power of the snake, which is embodied by Bilam. And the Arizal says the power is within the He, the Hevel. The positive power of the snake is the He, the breath that went to Moshe. Right? Moshe is Memshin He. And what's interesting is, since we already talked about Kundalini, you know, there's certain divine syllables in Hinduism. We talked about Om before, Om as this divine syllable. But the syllable, anybody know what the syllable of Kundalini is? It's a He, right? Ha. The syllable of Kundalini is Ha, right? That's the divine syllable. So even, again, there's a, a parallel there to what the Arizal is saying and what Hinduism is saying about this divine a serpentine energy associated with the syllable he with ha and actually the the zohar that says that uh, how did they original how did they eventually kill bilam the tanakh says that pinchas killed bilam and there are many midrashim as to how he did it but the zohar says that he couldn't they didn't know how to kill him and pinchas killed him with a sta- a sword that he made engraved with snakes on it so the power of the snake is in the mouth which gives off the hevel, right, the he. And how do you say mouth in Hebrew? Pe, right? Pe, he. Pe, pe, he. And what is the pe? The letter pe, which li- the letter pe means mouth. And what is the letter pe? The Zohar says the letter pe is a coiled snake. The shape of the letter pe is a coiled snake. And, there's a hidden bet in there. and inside the pe, if you look closely, there's a bet. Right? The, the, if the Torah is black fire on white fire, and every letter has a corresponding letter of white fire. So the pay in black, and inside in white, you have a little bet inside. Going back to the whole, to Bereshit, the power of speech in creating the whole cosmos. And we have this divine power of speech, which separates us from all the animals. We are a medaber, right? The sages divide up all of creation into four categories, into domem, which is inanimate objects, Tzomeach, which is plants and similar things. And then the chaya, or ba'alei chayim, which is the animals. And then the medaber, which is human. The only one that's able to actually speak. So we were given this divine power to speak. That's the pei. Pei he is the pei. And that's what it says about, about Mashiach. What does it say about Mashiach? V'shafat betzedek dalim ve'och... Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11. Ishayahu describes Mashiach and says, V'shafat betzedek dalim... That Mashiach will smite with his, with his mouth. And with his lips, he will defeat evil, the evil, yeah. This is the, I mean, we don't put hey in the year, but we are, like, after that, if we're in the pay era. That's right. Pay down, we're moving That's right. to pay we're in hey, pay. but we don't use hey. Exactly. Next year is pay hey. Right, so think about that. And next year is the Chinese year of the snake, which is where I'm getting. And the fuller year is Safa, Tafshin. Tafshin, exactly, Safa, and the mouth, perfect language. So there you go, a lot to meditate on as we move into 5785. And yeah, so Mashiach is, this, is, is able to fight 
with his mouth and with his tongue and with his speech. And so there's an association of the Nachash with Mashiach, just like Moses, just like Pinchas, now Mashiach. And you all heard this because I've said it a million times. But the Gimatri of Nachash is 358. The Gimatri of Mashiach is 358. Mashiach equals Nachash. It's 358. It's all the power of the snake. But the positive snake, the healing snake, the Nechash Nechoshet, right? the snake of Moses, the, not the evil snake, but the healing snake. And the, going back to cosmology and astrology or to astronomy, we, remember we have 88 constellations. We've been talking a lot about constellations recently. And there are 12 of the 88 are the zodiac constellations, which go along the ecliptic in the sky, your zodiac sign, but there's also a 13th zodiac. We spoke about this a few years ago. Uh, there was also a bunch of headlines a few years ago that your zodiac sign may have changed. You know, if your birthday is like November 30 to December 17, you have a new zodiac now. It's not exactly true, but there is a 13th zodiac sign. Anybody remember what it's called? The 13th zodiac that runs along, the, right, it runs along that same ecliptic line. And it's called Ophiuchus in Greek, or Serpentarius in Latin, which is literally the snake holder. Because the constellation, there's a constellation called Serpens, which is the snake constellation. It has the shape of like a long snake. And behind it is Ophiuchus, Serpentarius, which is, looks like a man holding the snake. So it's called the snake holder, right? Ophiuchus was this Greek deity hero. So they say it's November 30 to December 17. So it's between Scorpio and Sagittarius. But it doesn't actually connect to astrology so much, but I'll, I'll explain that in a second. So that there is this 13th zodiac, and it's the snake holder. And the ancient Greeks depicted this as the staff with the snake wrapped around it. Ophiuchus was the healer who has the healing staff, which is also the medical symbol to this day, is a staff with a snake wrapped around it, which some say goes to Ophiuchus, some say it goes to Moshe, who healed the people with his copper serpent staff. So you can choose which, it's probably, they're probably both true, but there's this idea of the staff with the snake wrapped around it as the healing snake. So that's Ophiuchus, and there's this constellation. And a few years ago, it was in the headlines because as the cosmos shifts, as the Earth's position moves, we know that we, the constellations, uh, we say that they, there are certain zodiacal constellations that dominate 2,000 years each. There's this procession of the equinoxes. So for the past 2,000 years, I mentioned this before, we were in the age of Pisces. Now we're moving into the age of Aquarius, right? And as, as everything is shifting, Ophiuchus becomes more prominent, some say. And so that's why there was this idea of, hey, your zodiac may have changed as the things, as we're shifting through space. So there's this 26,000 year cycle of the constellations. Each sign is said to rule for 2,000 years. So 26,000, that means you need 13 times 2,000, right? So you have 13 signs that each rules for 2,000 years. So we're moving into Aquarius, and it's like Ophiuchus is making a return, and that's a snake holder, which some associate with, as if the cosmos itself is reminding us that Mashiach is coming. And for us now in a leap year, it actually connects to the Jewish calendar really well because we have 12 months in a regular year, but in a leap year, we add another month. Like now, we're in a dark bet, we added a whole other month. So some people ask, well, what is the constellation of the 13th month? We don't have 13 constellations. Wrong, yes we do. We have 13 constellations. The mazal of the, thir- the 13th mazal is Ophiuchus, the snake holder. So that corresponds to the 13 months of the Jewish leap year. And so there is a hidden constellation. So it's another symbol of the forthcoming messianic age, God willing. And amazingly, you know, we say Mashiach is Mashiach ben David, right? Because he's the descendant of King David. And David was the son of who? Ishai. The son of Ishai. But there's a strange verse in Samuel, in second Shmuel Bet, that says, King David had a sister. Her name was Avigal. Not his wife, Avigail. King David had a wife, Abigail, Avigail. And he had a sister named Avigal. And in this pasuk, it says that Avigal, her name was Avigal Bat Nachash. Avigal Bat Nachash. What? Okay. And Rashi says, what's Bat Nachash? Who is Nachash? Who Yishai Avidavid. King David's father, Yishai, was called Nachash. 
And why was he called Nachash? Because our sages said, Raboteinu Amru Bebava Batra, in the Gemara it says, that Yishai was so righteous, Shemet Belo Avon, he died sinless, Be'etio Shel Nachash. The only reason he died is because of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, who caused Adam and Eve to eat from the fruit and bring death into the world. If it wasn't for the serpent, Ishai was perfectly sinless, he would have never died. So Rashi's quoting that and saying, that's why King David's father, Ishai, Jesse, they translate into English, was so, I don't know how they went from Ishai to Jesse. So Ishai was so righteous that he only died because of the Nachash. That's why his nickname was Nachash. So King David was David ben Ishai, but also David ben Nachash. Right, so another connection to Mashiach ben David ben Nachash. Now, where is the first connection between Mashiach and the Nachash? The first explicit almost connection, like without gematrias and things like that. So it comes from the prophecy of Yaakov before he passed away. His deathbed prophecy, it's the first time that the Torah mentions end of days. Yaakov called his children. Come and I will tell you what will happen in the end of days. It's the first time this term, end of days, this very overused term, end of days, the first time it's used in the Torah, one of only few times that it's used in the Torah, the first time is here. Yaakov says, come and I'll tell you what's going to happen at the end of days. It's the final prophecy. And yet when you read what he says afterwards, it doesn't seem like anything to do with the end of days. It just seems to be like blessings for his children. Where is the end of days? It's all encoded in there. If you read between the lines, it's actually encoding the end of days. Yaakov wanted to reveal the end of days. But as our sages say, the angels kind of stopped him and it wasn't the time to reveal it. So God didn't let him reveal those secrets, not in a revealed way, but he encoded it in his blessings. So it's all there, but you have to read between the lines. And then when he blesses Dan, one of his sons, Dan, what does he say? Dan yadina mo ke'echad shiftei Israel. Dan will judge ke'echad shiftei Israel. Yehi Dan, what? Dan Nachash Alei Derech. Dan should be the serpent on the road. Shfifon Alei Orach, the viper along the path. Hanoshech Ikveisus, who bites the horse's heel. Veipol Rochvachol, and the rider of the horse will fall back. And then Yaakov says something strange. So he's saying, Dan is going to be the judge, the one, the judge of, the, of all the tribes of Israel. And he will be like a snake upon the path. And he will bite the horse's heel. And then Yaakov ends by saying, I pray, I'm, I wait for your salvation. What? What does that have to do with anything? I can't wait for your salvation. What is going on? So what was, Ra- what was Yaakov saying? The Midrash said, Bereshit Rabbah says, Lefi shaya Yaakov avinu roe oto, vesavur bo shu melech ha-mashiach. Who is this talking about? Rashi says, who did he see? Rashi says, and our sages say, who is this Dan, who is Nachash alay derech? Who came from the tribe of Dan? Shimshon. Shimshon, right? The greatest hero from the tribe of Dan was Shimshon. Samson, the great one, who fought the Plishtim, who fought the Philistines in Gaza. Right? So he was the greatest of the, he, of the judges in the period of judges. So Rashi says that Yaakov saw Samson. That's who he was talking about. And the Midrash Bereshit Rabbah adds, Lefi shaya Yaakov avinu roe oto, he saw him, v'savur bo she'u melech ha-mashiach. Yaakov saw Samson and said, he's Mashiach. Samson is the Mashiach. He's the potential Messiah of his generation. This special child who was holy from birth, who was prophesied to Manoach and his wife. Kevan shara'o to shemet, but when Yaakov saw that he died, that Samson died, amar af zemet. Ah, even this one also is dying. Right? He was another potential Mashiach who was so close, but he died and failed. And that's why he said, When will your, your salvation finally come? Another potential Mashiach died. Another potential Mashiach died. None of them are getting it done. They're all getting so close. And they can, even this one died. So Samson was the potential Mashiach of his generation. And he died fighting the Plishtim. You remember the story, right? He pulled down the, they had him chained to the temple and he pulled down the the pillars and collapsed them on all the plishtim and thereby saved Israel from their oppressors for a certain period of time. 
Now, the Arizal says, you know, in one place in Tanakh, in Shmuel, do you know what Shmuel calls Shimshon? Something strange. He doesn't call him Shimshon. Shmuel says, Ve'ishlach Hashem et Yerubaal. God sent you Yerubaal. Who's Yerubaal? Gidon. Gidon's name was, one of the judges was Gidon. His name was Yerubaal. So Shmuel says, God sent you all these judges. Yerubaal. Ve'et Bedan. Ve'et Iftach. Okay, Iftach we know. Ve'et Shmuel. We know those other judges. Yerubaal we know. That's, that's Gidon. Iftach we know. That's clearly in the Tanakh. Shmuel we know. Who's Bedan? There's no mention of Bedan in Judges. Who's Bedan? Bedan is the person from the tribe of Dan, who is Shimshon. So the Arizal asks this question, since when is he called Bedan? What is this bizarre word? Right? He's Shimshon. Why couldn't Shmuel just say, God sent you Shimshon? That would have been really clear and obvious. So the Arizal says something amazing. Gambe inyan Shimshon, this is in Shara Gilgulim. Rav Chaim Vital says, Amar li Morizal, ki zeh sod pasuk ve'ishlach Hashem et Yerubal ve'et Bedan. What is the secret of this verse that God sent Bedan? That, Bedan zeh Shimshon. Bedan is Shimshon. Why? Meaning, Midan, he came from Dan. Ve'ainyan hu, the secret here is, ki Shimshon hu gilgul Nadav ben Aaron HaKohen. So Nadav, the son of Aaron. What did Nadav do wrong? He went into the, temp- to the Mishkan to serve God, which he wasn't allowed to do, and he was killed, right? A fire came out from wherever, from the Holy of Holies, and consumed him and his brother, Nadav and Avihu. So the Arizal says Nadav reincarnated in Shimshon. Shimshon is the reincarnation of Nadav. Uh-huh. So Bedan is secretly, the Torah is trying to secretly tell you that Shimshon was Nadav. It's the same letters backwards. So he came back as Shimshon. And why did he have to come back as Shimshon? What is the tikkun there? What is the rectification? He had to reincarnate. Because every reincarnation is for a good reason, to rectify the soul. What did he have to rectify? What was the soul of, what was the sin of Nadav? What did he do wrong? So Eshdara, but like, what, like why? He didn't really do anything illegal. Like what was his was he demerit? To change, uh... No, no. So it says what he did was, we know that Nadav and Avihu were single. They didn't get married. They left no progeny. So our sages say it's because they felt like they were too, too good for, you know, none of the daughters of Israel were good for them. They were so holy. They didn't want to get married. So the Arizal explains, He didn't want to take a wife. He thought he was too good for a wife. Right? Wrong. So he, what ended up happening? That's why Ne'enas Shimshon that that's why Shimshon was punished with all these Philistine women that he got involved with and ultimately succumbed by B. He had this great temptation. God brought him back and gave him uh, this temptation for women. And we see Shimshon always going around with Plishti women and ultimately they were the cause of his downfall as a rectification for avoiding women in his past life. So in his next life, he couldn't avoid them at all. <laughs> and... And... The other opinion, the other mistake that Nadav and Avihu did is that they were a little bit under the influence. And we know that because the Torah later prohibits Kohanim from going into the temple or serving while inebriated or having had any alcohol. So that's why Shimshon was born. And from birth, he was told, you cannot drink wine. Right? He was a Nazir. He was forbidden from drinking wine from birth. Right, so that was a tikkun for Nadav, both for the sin of not getting married and for the sin of coming into the temple drunk. So Shimshon was supposed to rectify both. So he is Bedan, who is Nadav, who is Shimshon. Okay, excellent. By the way, people who recently are commenting on YouTube like that they, they don't like reincarnation, that I, don't, that I bring up reincarnation. There's somehow people still don't get the point that you, have, you can't understand anything in the Torah without reincarnation. So, reincarnation is a thing, get over it. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, there's all these mysteries. Well, we'll do a class on reincarnation 
uh, sometime soon in depth of proving where, how do we know? It's so, it's obvious, it's clear from everywhere in Tanakh, including in Job, where Job has a verse where he clearly says that God brings people back into this world second, a second time and a third time and whatever. We'll do a, a separate class on that. Okay, so Shimshon was this potential Mashiach, the Nachash Alay Derech, the snake upon the path, and he sets the stage for the Davidic dynasty because Shimshon was basically one of the last judges after him is already Eli and Shmuel, and then the Davidic dynasty not long after that. So King De- uh, Shimshon sets the stage. He subdues the Philistines long enough to bring about the Davidic dynasty, and then David himself finishes the job. That's why there's this connection between Shimshon and bringing about as a st- early steps to the redemption, like Shimshon brought about the Davidic dynasty and that same energy is needed today. And I don't know if you've seen, there was a video going around of people uh, talking about Shimshon fighting in Gaza and how that connects to the current war in Gaza. Uh, some people... Like I'm not sure. There was a, it was going out around the internet in a few places. Some people yeah. said it, attributed it to the Lubavitcher Rebbe's father, so Rebbe Levi Yitzhak Schneerson. Yeah, let me get to that. So some people attributed to the Lubavitcher Rebbe's father. He didn't actually say it exactly like that. Some people attribute to the Vilna Gaon. It doesn't really matter who said it, that, but the, the idea here is, is really important. Because it says in Shoftim and Judges, where it talks about Shimshon, this is what it says, chapter 16. Vayelech Shimshon, where did he go? Azata. He went to Gaza. Shimshon went to Gaza. And he came to a harlot, apparently. Although some people say, and the Radak says, that a zona doesn't necessarily mean a harlot. A zona can also mean a woman who is notenet mazon, who is an innkeeper, a pundakit, an innkeeper who, whatever, she had a restaurant or something. So that's an, a way to soften it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, so let as a team, and then it continues. Let as a team, and then the Gazans, they, it was told to them, let emor ba Shimshon, henna. So they heard that Shimshon was around. So the Gazans went, yesubu veyarvulo kol alayla b'sharayir. And so they were planning an ambush by the gates of Gaza all night. Veitcharashu kol alayla leemor ad or aboker vehargenuhu. So... The morning's going to come. He's going to come through these gates and we're going to ambush him and we're going to kill him. But Shimshon slept till midnight and then got up. He got up at midnight and what did he do? He ripped off the gates of Gaza. And together with the... What do you call it? Yeah, what, yeah, with the pole. Uh, the, yeah, Bariach is, transla- is that translated. I don't know what they trans- how they translated it here. The two gate poles. I don't know, whatever. The lap. It's like the, it's the, the, yeah, it's this thing. The deadbolt, yeah. So he took the Bariach, ve'yasem al k'tefav, and put him on his shoulders, ve'yalem al rosh ha'ar, asher al pnei chevron. So this is what he did. He ripped off the gates and put them, carried them all the way up to Hebron, which is quite far away. And so the, the Philistines got scared and ran away. What, what does this have to do with anything? That's how the story basically ends. What does this have to do with anything? So Shimshon was so powerful, he ripped off the doors, the gates, and carried them off. And the Gemara says something again, puzzling. Tanya Amar Rabbi Shimon Chasid, Ben Ktefav Shel Shimshon, Shishim Amahaya. That the shoulders of Shimshon, the width, his shoulder span was 60 cubits. Now, again... Let's ha- have our metaphorical hats on. Obviously, he was not 60 f- cubits wide. Actually, the Gemara says that Shimshon was not necessarily particularly physically strong. He was even, some say, lame in both feet. And he, wasn't, he was only strong when God infused him with strength. Otherwise, he was actually not particularly... Yeah, exactly. He wasn't particularly powerful visually. So, we quoted that pasuk. What does that mean? We know, actually, the Ein Glatot Aza, the gates of Gaza at the time, were 60, Ein Pachot Mishishim Ama, were no less than 60 cubits. The gates of Gaza in those days were 60 cubits wide, which means 60 cubits is like 120 feet. A cubit's about two feet. So, like 120 feet, 40 ish meters, 35, 40 meters. 
Yeah, it's, it's massive. So somehow he was able to lift it. So the sages say, what, does that mean that Samson's shoulders carried 60 cubits? Like, is this possible? Can't be literally true. So what, what is the Gemara saying here? What is the point of the Gemara telling us this? We always have to ask that question. The Gemara seems to have strange statements like this. Who cares? Why is this relevant? It seems to have no significance. Well, who cares? What does that have to do with anything? It's like a random statement in the Gemara. Why does it say that? So everything has cryptic significance. What is the deeper meaning here? Where does this number of 60 cubits come from? In Tanakh, there are two things that were 60 cubits. The gates of Gaza were 60 cubits and? Not quite. That was 300 by 50 by 30. Okay. So there's, we read it in a Haftarah, I believe, recently. In the book of Kings, it says, V'abayit asher bana ha-melech shlomo. And the house that King Solomon built for God, Hashem. King Solomon built the house of God for Hashem. How big was the first temple? King Solomon's Jerusalem temple. Shishim ama oko. All right, the temple, King Solomon's temple, was 60 cubits long. And so therefore, there's this idea. Again, I don't know who said it first. It's been going around on the internet. I didn't come up with this. But there's this idea of the sages telling us that the gates of Gaza were 60 cubits and the temple was 60 cubits. And if you want the temple, first Gaza has to be subdued. So make with that what you wish. Okay? Make with that what you wish. And remember, Aza literally means, what does Aza mean? Aza means brazen. Aza means people with such intense chutzpah. Right? People who come, foreigners who come to a land and say it's their own and then commit acts of terror and play the victim. We're the good guys. We did nothing wrong. And then the whole world goes on their side. Right? So that's Azza, the brazen-faced ones. They, they slaughter those kids. They bring the women the bad guys. Exactly. Exactly. The, the terrorists, the actual evil ones, play the victim. They're the poor, innocent civilians that are, that are being killed for no reason. They did nothing wrong. They're just living happily, uh, you know, living peacefully in their tunnels. And, uh, but we're, Israel is the bad guy, right? So that's Azza, literally, the brazen-faced. And Shimshon uh, showed us how to deal with that kind of right. mindset. So Shimshon was the snake, the Dan who was Nachash Alay Derech, and Noshech Ikvesus. He bites the horse's heel because he fought in a very, he had to fight in a very circuitous way. He couldn't go head on. So that's, that was Shimshon. And that's Mashiach is described the same way. And the, 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 the horse is always in, in Jewish tradition a symbolic of war. The sages say, what is a sus? He's called sus, a horse, because he's sas lekrav, that he's happy to run into war. You know, the horse is just happy to run. And he's happy and he runs in any, he, he goes into the battlefield, he runs towards war. So the, the, the horse is like a symbol of war, like the original tank, you know, the military tank. And our sages say... Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai taught, Im ra'ita sus parsi kashur bekivrei Eretz Yisrael, if you see a Persian horse tied to the graves of Israel, tzapel ha shel Mashiach. When you see the Persian horse causing graves in Israel, wait, till, wait for Mashiach. So if you think about the horses today in Israel and their Persian, Iranian financiers, the main financiers of those that are causing graves in Israel today, Hamas's backers. That's the Sus Palsi. So Rashbi said already 2,000 years ago, when you see the Persian horse tied to the graves of Israel, causing deaths in Israel, Tzapel HaGlav Shel Mashiach. Mashiach is coming. So who knows? Maybe Mashiach is in Gaza already now, fighting those Persian horses, and let's hope it'll be soon. So let's put it all together. Let's put it all together and conclude. So we had the first serpent, which was the Tanin Gadol, which was this Leviathan, this dragon, okay, this terrible dragon. And ultimately, Mashiach is supposed to slay the remaining one. God slayed the first one, and there's a remaining one from which will be the Sukkah and all that. So we have that. Then we have the Nachash, which is actually seen as a negative sign, but often actually is, is a positive figure associated with higher wisdom, with prophecy, with giving mankind not like divine knowledge. And then Isaiah, Ishayah, who actually alludes to the bo- both snakes, and says, On that day God will slaughter 
the Aliviatan Nachash Bariach, the straight, again the word Bariach, the, the, the straight, the pole serpent, the Aliviatan Nachash Akalton, and the twisted serpent. So there's a twisted serpent and there's a pole serpent. There's a straight serpent and a twisted serpent. And depending on who you ask, there's different rabbinic opinions, but some say that this is exactly one is the good snake and one is the bad snake. The twisted snake is more of the dragon, the Leviathan, and the straight snake is that healing snake. It's the pole. It's the healing pole. It's the healing staff. And the Zohar also says that these Taninim, taninim Agdolim, Daya Akov Esav. One is Yaakov, one is Esav. Right? The twisted serpent, the dragon, is symbolic of the power of Esav. The straight serpent is Yaakov, is Israel, who's Yashar El, right? Israel is Yashar El, the straight one. So this is a Zohar, in Zohar 138b. So that the two, the Taninim, the two Taninim Akdolim are Yaakov and Esav. So we have this idea of one serpent defeating the other serpent, right? Mashiach, the, the positive Nachash, destroying the negative one, the Leviathan. So Mashiach is Ophiuchus, the he, the, that constellation, the healing snake. Uh, and you might parallel the Leviathan. There's another constellation. What's the dragon constellation? Draco. It's one of the biggest constellations in the sky. Some people say when Sefer Yetzirah talks about the Tli, it's referring to Draco, which is also a very important constellation. But we'll leave it for another time. It's not on. It's right in the center, actually. So everything kind of seems to rotate around it. So that's... And there's a question if that's... So the, the North Pole guy, right? Yeah, so it used to be. One of the stars in Draco used to align with the North Pole. So we have two serpents, the Nachash Bariach and the Nachash Akalton. The twisted serpent is usually seen as this dragon, this fire-breathing dragon, the Leviathan. The straight serpent is the healing serpent, the, the serpent of, uh, of Mashiach. And it's interesting, again, another beautiful gematria. Just as Mashiach equals Nachash, 358, Leviathan, do the gematria of Leviathan, Lamed Vav Yud Taf Nun is 496. 496 is Gimatria of Malchut. Mem Lamed Kaf Vav Taf. So in the same way that there's this Nachash Mashiach connection, there's a Leviathan and Malchut connection. Same idea, actually. Exactly. So we have the dragon, and then we have the snake, and then we have Yaakov saying that the snake will bite the horse's heel, make his rider fall back put an end to the wars, the horse being the symbol for war. And so that was all an introduction to part two, which we'll do next time, which is something amazing in the cosmos, which is that this year, according to the Chinese zodiac, is the year of the dragon. And next year in the year of the zodiac, or the Chinese zodiac, is the year of the snake. And the following year on the Chinese zodiac is the year of the horse. So just like you have the dragon, the serpent, the snake, and the horse, we have in the Chinese zodiac, we have this sequence of, in Chinese mythology, which is this great cosmic race, where you have this exact progression of the dragon, the snake, and the horse. Next time we want to explore, what does the Chinese zodiac have to do with Judaism? It seems like these two things are completely not connected, that there's nothing to do, like Judaism has nothing to do with China. It's probably you think that the sages never even talked about China, like it has no connection to Judaism. But in fact, if you actually go a little deeper, you will find that there's such a deeply profound connection between Israel and China, you will actually be shocked. It'll knock your socks off, I promise you. There's a very deep connection. In fact, our sages debated this relationship between Israel and Sin and China already over a thousand years ago. And there is definitely a deep connection there. So we're going to do the J Chinese zodiac in Judaism next time in part two. Okay, so we'll end there for tonight. That's